young leaders are critical to the future of the federal government. That maxim certainly true in highly technical fields like blockchain and cybersecurity. The relationship between those two areas could break down silos in government. Joining me now are Isaac Chang, Blockchain Program Manager at IBM Federal, Michael Youngdahl, Blockchain Foundation Developer at IBM, and Emily Miller, Director of National Security and Critical Infrastructure Programs at Mokana. Thanks all very much for coming on. Uh, I want to start with you, Ryza. Um, I've heard a lot about blockchain and going paperless in the federal government and some certain use cases that DHS is doing. Mm -hmm. um, it's very similar to what also what we're doing at IBM in the federal government on helping the government going from blockchain and commercial and then going to federal going across the federal government on use cases such as transferring um, human capital data from agency to agency or also helping USDA or Postal Service on international um, shipment for transparency and also providing some security around transferring data. Michael, what's your top takeaway? Uh, so I think what's really good is that we're really getting into um, how each use case is going to work. Mm -hmm. And so we're getting away from, oh, we're going to do blockchain as a concept, and really getting into, okay, does it really address a problem that we're having here? Mm -hmm. Emily, that's been the biggest challenge, I think, for government over the years as new technologies have emerged. This was a, a cloud thing. This was especially a huge problem with social media eight, ten years ago. We're going to be on Facebook. Well, what are you going to do there? Well, we're going to be on Facebook. How is that different, do you think, in blockchain, in that government is looking for uses, looking for working the mission, rather than just trying to leverage new technology for the technology's sake? I think what's really interesting about what we heard is there's a recognition that blockchain is not the be-all, end-all, one solution that's going to solve all of our cybersecurity problems. And it's really encouraging to hear that from the federal government because, as you said, mm -hmm. there has been a lot of, oh, the blockchain, something cryptocurrency, something, something, we must use it, it's great. Um, but when we see it in terms of what Oki was talking about in terms of it's not the end of the cybersecurity uh, rainbow here, we're not trying to solve all of the problems, but instead present real use cases that harness the power of the blockchain um, without forgetting the rest of what's needed in uh, defense and depth methodology. Mm -hmm. Michael, one of the challenges I think that exists here is one of the things about the trust element of the blockchain is that people can open it up and see how the different, why the elements are there and how they got there, who put them yeah. there. That's terrific on the one hand for open government. It's potentially tragic on the other hand because everybody can see everything mm -hmm. and potentially how do you keep that trust in an open environment like that where everybody has access to everything? You know, that, that's actually a great question. And um, this is one of the differences between permissionless blockchain, uh, which you might be more familiar with in terms of Ethereum and Bitcoin, and something like permissioned blockchain, which might be like a, a Hyperledger instance or something like that. Um, with a permissioned blockchain, you have access controls in place such that not everyone is going to be able to see the contents of each transaction that is logged on the blockchain. Uh, and so that privacy allows you to kind of have your data and share it too to make sure that you can have entities that might not always have the same uh, goals to both interact and trust each other on the same blockchain. That seems to be, to me, Riza, one of the most important elements of the role that blockchain then can potentially play right. in IT modernization yes. as it becomes reliable, trustable. That, I guess, will open people's minds up to new possibilities where that it that wasn't necessarily something where somebody logically would go, well, we should use a distributed ledger type solution in this use case, whatever it may be. Exactly. Is that a fair observation? Yes, it's very fair. Um, it, we call it smart contracts with Hyperledger where each participant in the blockchain actually has their own rules and boundaries to be able to use it securely and transparent, transparency across the federal government. Most of the work that we've seen so far has been pilot programs. There's one at the Treasury Department. Yep. We've seen others. At what point do you expect to see that kind of break out? And do you expect to see or, um, uh, government organizations go, all right, this is ready for prime time. We're comfortable with this and we're ready to scale it. Um, to be honest, I think it's more educating and awareing people or the government that what is blockchain. There's a lot of you know um, confusion that it's cryptocurrency and we're creating currency for the government. No, it's it's an enablement. It's a mechanism that we can use to transfer data from another location faster in real time mm -hmm. and going completely paperless. So, Michael, given that, do you think it will take a lot more? pilot programs, small opportunities to leverage blockchain like some of the things that we've discussed before some agency will say, all right, it's, we can blow this up, we can, we can do this on a very large scale. 
So I think what's going to happen is you're going to get an agency who is able to implement on a production level, and then once one agency has that production implementation, everyone's going to breathe a sigh of relief and say, hey, we're not going to be the first. It's a, mm -hmm. you know, we've proven it out, and we want to jump right in. And that, Emily, is I think then will be where we see a snowball effect, do you think? I mean, is this that kind of technology? It is. I, I mean, it is one something that the government is really going to latch on to, but something that I would caution that we haven't really talked about yet, we talked a lot about enterprise networks, we haven't talked a lot about the application of blockchain for the Internet of Things mm -hmm. and IoT and operational technology as well. And I think that's some place to really think about. We have these fantastic use cases um, for enterprise systems and enterprise networks and the type of data that you can use there, but it's a little bit different in terms of its utility when you're talking about IoT. How so? Well, with IoT, you have to remember you're talking about process controls. And so um, I make a, a you know, comparison between traditional industrial control systems and the Internet of Things because the type of process controls that you're doing are very similar in terms of the types of things that they do. Um, IoT is a much bigger scale, of course. But when you're thinking about security for IoT, blockchain provides that ledger of the data. So you can have a lot of untrustworthy devices that you're accepting a level of risk, but that you use the blockchain as an enabler for security technologies to basically lock down the data once it's there. But what it doesn't do is actually secure the device itself. You don't know if the data itself is good by the time it hits the blockchain, so the input validation question. And when you're making in IoT and control systems life and death decisions, it's very different than what you're talking about in terms of privacy or mm -hmm. in terms of um, human resources data. All of that's very important. That's not to negate the importance of the other, but it is a very different type of use in terms of what a control system or an IIoT or IoT would use. We're almost out of time, so 20 to 30 seconds apiece, and Emily, I'll start with you. What haven't we talked about so far that people in a public sector, particularly a federal government setting, should be thinking about as they're thinking about ways to apply blockchain to potential problems that they have? I think we've talked about it, but I would reiterate that blockchain is not the end of the security. It's an enabler of security solutions, that you're using a distributed ledger to make the data trustworthy as it exists in the ledger. Michael? Uh, I think that the important thing to take away as to why would I use a blockchain uh, is if your use case involves uh, creating more trust, transparency, and accountability within your business network, uh, and one person doesn't own all of the data, then you might have a good use case for blockchain. Marissa? Um, that it's people, process, and technology to build a good solution, enabling having blockchain as part of that solution. And that's different, not any different than any other kind of technology that the government's applied throughout exactly. its history, right? Exactly. Thanks all very much for joining me. Thank I appreciate you so much. It. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you for watching this special program, Innovation That Works.